Hello and welcome to Building the Premier Accounting Firm. This is an episode for all those who are interested in working on your business. This show is dedicated to actually helping owners of bookkeeping, accounting, and tax businesses run their businesses to build what I refer to as the Premier Accounting Firm in their area. It's heard that we discuss a variety of topics that range from marketing, selling, pricing, tech stacks, onboarding, and so much more. And today's going to be an amazing conversation. This is something that I've been looking forward to for a number of weeks now. This gentleman is Lawrence Widom. He happens to be the chief outsourcing officer who has a decade of experience working with over 500 accounting firms from across the United States. He has created Impact Global Solutions to support firms with their implementation of outsourcing. He simplifies the process of outsourcing for firms so that they can do it successfully and knows which outsourcing vendors are the best in class for certain services. Outsourcing is a journey in which both parties need to follow best practices implement standard operating procedures, strategize, and be a true partner, which is what Lawrence helps them implement. So Lawrence, welcome to the show. Thanks, Roger. Really appreciate it and excited to be here. You know, I was actually in a conversation uh, just recently, and I was asked, what are the three big things I see on the horizon for the accounting profession? And one of the things that I spoke of is the use of outsourcing services, how that's going to become quite relevant, quite prominent. So I'm very eager to have this conversation only because it's something that's coming up quite often. So I'm curious, Lawrence, when we first met, we were talking about your experience and background and how you got into this space. Let's start there. What kind of background do you have? What brought you to the idea of working with accounting firms to help them with this outsourcing situation? Yeah, so I was uh, actually coming out of college. I was not on the line to go into the accounting industry necessarily, um, but got a reach out from a family friend of ours in England. Um, and he brought me over to India where he built an offshore center for accounting firms in the UK, actually, um, with the with the idea in his head that he wanted really to help me start them up in the US, um, which was great. I mean, I spent three months there in India in Ahmedabad. Um, so got to know a bit about the culture, got to know about the operation. And then again, about a month in, he then dropped it on me like, okay, I want you to really help us start this. Um, so uh, immediately sort of hit the ground running and it was very much like building my own business here in the US, which was very cool from like a young young perspective, really coming out of college and um, and literally had to set up the office, get everything moving and very quickly learn like, again, the the industry itself is very personable. Like we have to get out there. I have to get to know people as much as possible and educate on outsourcing in general. And it was so much different 10 years ago than it is today as to we had small firms and large firms, but even large firms were just even just exploring the idea of it other than the big four. So it was quite a new area for firms to look into when it came to outsourcing 10 years ago. So when you look at the last 10 years, what would you say has been the, let's say, the evolution of the outsourcing picture? Um, I've definitely seen how COVID impacted it, but with your experience, what would you say has been the evolution, the learning curve and the application of it in the accounting space? Yeah, so it's it was exploratory for everybody, and I I think they a lot of firms would jump around from vendor to vendor. A lot had bad experiences doing it as well, um, and partially because it was a bit of a taboo subject to speak about and to do. So everybody was a bit, uh, can I really do this? What will my clients think about it? So it really went from having to really persuade people just to explore it and understand what was going on and like dip their toe in the water to becoming a bit more of a need now because it was in demand. Like, again, we all hear about the staffing shortages and I, and I try not to hit on the negative side of it because there are so many firms changing the industry right now as to like what they're doing and they are building better practices and a bit more exploring, bringing on new talent in different areas in the U S but, but there is still somewhat of a shortage. So now it became a bit more of a need where firms were having to invest a little bit more in it. And, and that has changed the conversation from maybe a third of people doing it, a third exploring it and a third um, not looking at it at all and being completely against it to, 80% Eighty percent of eighty uh, percent of the larger firms are doing it now. Uh, you've got a lot of small firms doing it and actually like scaling very well. Um, and I would say it's probably closer to sixty percent doing it or trying it 
And there's only probably about 20% now, 10 to 20% not doing it at all and really against it still. Um, yeah. So it's changed a lot more from the having to persuade just the idea of it to now educating on how to do it right. I, I love your kind of summary of that because I can relate to it quite a bit. Having done this for more than 20 years, I've seen this evolution. I've experienced it. I do remember it being kind of one of those early adopter type things where people who were on the cutting edge would embrace the opportunity to try something new, something sexy and exciting. Uh, now it's more more normal. It's more mainstream. It's more common. And I appreciate your illustrating that. So um, there are a number of things that I really am excited to discuss with you about all this. Um, just to kind of jump into it, though, when I first ex was exposed to the idea of outshore, outshore or offshoring uh, and outsourcing it, it was there were safe rooms. There was the issue of access to quality individuals with, say, either CPAs or chartered, uh, chartered accountants. So there was definitely the level of experience that you would hope for. Um, so you're getting a more affordable skill set. Uh, you had the safe rooms that were an issue. There was a question about uh, taking people and obviously working with someone outside of the United States for those that are U.S. Uh, businesses. I think all of those things have been addressed now. What, what are some of the concerns that or maybe more common today, because I don't know that those are even relevant any longer. Yeah, and I honestly, I had a conversation last week with uh, a couple of partners that I've known for 10 years. They saw me in probably one of the first events I did, and, and his first comment was like, we had these concerns of IT and how it was set up, and we honestly don't have those concerns anymore. But the biggest concern, and I would say comes around that education of, how do we actually do it though, mm -hmm. right? Because it's it's still, again, that taboo subject of there aren't many people talking about how they're doing it successfully because they've been, again, the firm itself doesn't necessarily want to brand themselves out there as like, yeah, we're doing this. Um, there are some now starting to do that, which is great. Um, but you see like even in the local societies, I, I still personally get a bit of pushback from some societies that don't want to talk about this right and educate on these topics as much because they're happy to have vendors there and they're inclusive of that side of it but they don't want to necessarily put an edu educational sessions on because they it's still very new to them right so they don't want to necessarily push themselves out there and it, it is seen in a negative light because some firms don't want to talk about it right and i i sit on different round tables and things like that and it's the same thing it probably takes 30 minutes to an hour just to get some firms to really open up even that are doing it to talk about some of these areas that they're having trouble with right mm -hmm. so it's it's simply that first step get in there and making sure the education is built around it and there's best practices like how do we do this once that's there, I think you'll find a lot more firms being a lot more open to these discussions. Um, and because they always get surprised, like even like with the disclosure stuff, like the, for one of that big challenge is like, oh, I just don't want to put out that disclosure form and things. And then as soon as they, I got a call from a partner yesterday and he said, we've got it, we've got one, or, we've got one letter back and it was signed. <laughs> so, and that's, they're a big group right there I was talking to. And they were like, even that first letter was that comfort factor for him to call uh -huh. me and say, we've got it, right? We got our first sign. We're actually pretty optimistic now. So, and you'll be surprised, like 80% of the businesses they send it out to will, will sign that 7216 disclosure and stuff. So it's just that, that comfort level has got to rise up a bit. And that can only be done by education and through talking. So just before we move on from this, for my listeners, explain what that form is in layman terms. So for the, when you're looking to explore tax outsourcing specifically, right, uh, and you're going to use outsourcing offshore or a contractor, you should really have this document called the 7216 regulation signed. The AICPA even provides like different templates of it and things like that. And it's pretty much a one-page document that can be put in your engagement letter that says we are using a third party to outsource and you can let them know who they are you can different ones have different amounts of detail in there but you do have to disclose if you're looking to outsource specifically individual tax returns business tax it's like a paragraph you put in there that most firms will have that type of language in there already 
Yeah, thank you for that, because I think it's important that we understand what the client needs to know about this experience. So that's important. So that brings me to these challenges. I was mentioning that there were concerns early on. I think those have been eliminated. What are some of the biggest challenges that firms are facing today as it relates to outsourcing or offshoring? So let's say setting up like the process with the communication aspect. Okay, specifically. So firms find it extremely difficult. And one of the biggest challenges is that communication aspect with, because A, there's a cultural difference in these areas, right? But also firms are still getting used to working a bit more virtually than they have previously, right? So the big thing, like you mentioned, like COVID shook things up and it really helped the actual outsourcing and offshoring side of things because they now got to experience what it was like even managing their own team members who they were sat next to previously, but virtually, right? So you start to have a bit more understanding and and a bit more comfort and relaxation around like, okay, I do need to explain this a little bit better in an email for somebody to actually be able to act, complete the work, right? And or put together a bit more of a process to do it properly, right? Whereas before they would come to you, if you sat next to you, they would ask you a quick question, you'd answer it and it's human touch. So it's, it's okay, right? You forget about it and it's done, right? It doesn't seem silly asking the question, right? But this is what a lot of outsourcing firms struggle with is that communication aspect of reaching back out. The teams are typically not ones that will say, I've got a question, let me go to you and ask you right now when I have the question. They'll wait until the end or sometimes they don't feel comfortable even raising that question to you because they all feel silly themselves. Like, oh, is this a bad question to ask, right? So it's that encouragement of like a learning culture. It's different from like India, the Philippines, South Africa, South America to the US, right? Mm -hmm. So that blend is very difficult to really get over without experiencing it at the end of the day. So that would say number one challenge. Well, I'm going to add to this. One of the things that I've experienced is exactly the issue of processes. And I think the misunderstanding is even if, an, if, if a firm was to hire someone in the office, we would expect there to be some type of training. There's there's something to say when the person comes on board, here's how we do the work here. This is the process that you're going to follow. And when you have standard operating procedures, you better ensure that the quality of the work is going to be there and that you're predicting the, the, the uh, predictable result at the end. Well, now you go to, just as you described, you've got a person that is not in the office. They're not able to just kind of lean over or come over and ask. What's happening is you've got a remote worker. Let's say somebody works in the same state, out of state. They're remote, they are a remote worker, and you would like to ensure their success by providing them these processes. Well, this extends clearly to offshoring. I think one of the misconceptions is because these people are let's say CPAs and they're skilled individuals, they're educated individuals, that because of their education and experience, I can just send them the work to be done and they read my mind and we assume they're going to take care of the work. And what we're doing is we're setting them up for failure just like we would any employee that we're just saying, okay, congratulations, you got the job, here's the work, go to work, and you offer them no training. And so I love how you've emphasized that the first challenge is clearly the processes that you have in place to ensure that the work's being done as you would expect it to be done. You're setting the individual up, whether it's local or remotely, to be successful. So excellent point. What's your second one? It would probably be buy-in, to be honest, across. And, and this comes with a couple of areas like culture as well. Um, but buy-in within the firm, right, to actually do it and make it successful. And what I mean by that is there's generally uh, – small firms are a slightly different story because you've got the owner there that's saying, okay, let's do this, right? And they're generally becoming that that – key person interacting with things. But when you start to build out a team as well and have them coordinate, you need to delegate a champion, right? It can't be an owner in a firm doing everything, right? Or a partner specifically like doing all the coordination. You generally have to delegate those responsibilities, right? But we need to make sure that we select the right champion in the firm to really, that is A, on board with it, and be the right person to do the job as well, right? It's not necessarily the the person that needs the staff the most as well in a lot of cases, like, or the partner that needs it the most is the right one to do it to start with because they're going to be pushing different 
derogatives to to make it happen right and they're going to be a bit more rash to the decision of this isn't working compared to somebody that's a bit more flexible and can spend the time training as well because they've got more flexibility in their team so so definitely that internal buy-in within the firm is probably one of the biggest like second biggest concerns that i find because they think they're doing it well they may have had one or two people offshore and but for a firm that's 100 200 people on shore as well or even if it's 20 30 people on shore you should be looking at closer to like 15 to 30 percent of your team can be offshored a lot of that back office work can be done right and you shouldn't have those staffing challenges really but it's the we don't know what that framework is. We don't know like, okay, what number should I be reaching, right? We don't have a plan in place. So it's it's a lot of different things incorporated within it, but it needs to be led from the partner, right? And the different partners within the firm. And if the whole company doesn't buy into it, you're going to struggle to make it work. Yeah. So here's a few things that I'm hearing you address, and I like how you're bringing it up. One, you've got to have buy-in within the organization, whether it be the owner or other individuals within the firm, to say, this is how we're doing business. And the way I would add to that is you, you've spoken briefly or mentioned a chief outsourcing officer, and we'll circle back to this, but having someone that is the point individual within the organization that can take the lead as being the liaison with all these remote workers, I think that's important because everybody needs to know, okay, who's responsible for this? And if they're just these offshore individuals that we just kind of push to the side and we don't bring them into our culture and don't include or involve them, we we tend to alienate them. And so we want to include them as much as we can, which brings me to my next point, which is on your website, I'm assuming many people actually have, here's my a page dedicated to here's my team. This is the individual. Uh, these are the people that work on the work, uh, do the work around the office. Well, what we want to do is possibly go to the point of even though we have 1099 contract individuals, outsource service individuals, we may want to see them as part of the team and put them on the page accordingly and have them appear as these key individuals that are in the organization doing the work. And if we can help them feel as if they're included in part of the process, they'll actually feel like they have purpose, that they are contributing to the greater whole, that they are part of the bigger company. And the nuance of the fact that they're either 1099 or offshore employees is something that's semantics at this point. They are the key individuals that are helping the success of the business and taking care of the clients. And so that obviously brings me to this chief oper- uh, chief outsourcing officer. Uh, what what does that title mean? What does that represent in a company? Yeah, so it, partially the investment into what you're doing, right, is that there's somebody dedicated to it. And, and I've found personally in this industry that the firms that are running more like a business Right. And in investing in bringing on, like, let's say a, a COO as well, right? An operation expert, right? Sometimes they are an accountant, sometimes they're not, but they're very good at drilling down on the processes and taking a step back and looking at it. Okay, we need to be doing this, right? This is the extra training we need. This is the efficiency in the process we need to make. Now, this is a chief outsourcing officer is now thinking about getting somebody that's experienced working with international teams that can be that liaison that can help with setting a strategy in place and really focusing 100% on let's make this work. Because for every FTE, like full-time employee that we talk about, or new team member we add offshore especially, but also like onshore as well, there are options and things. But the more we utilize that, the quicker we can scale, the more profitable we can become. Because on average, like you may say 30 to $60,000 per person in some cases that you offshore, right? So compared to an onshore salary. So you've got to, like, people need to realize that and be like, okay, so if I actually put some effort into this and get more people offshore, now I can really start building it and investing in it and building out a proper structure and everything like that. But without somebody driving that, it's going to fall through the cracks, right? It's, it's, it's just like saying, I want to do this, but I don't want to put any effort into doing it. It's not going to work, right? Yeah, the the attitude that you're bringing here is the fact that this needs to be treated as if this is part of your integral team to be successful. This is this is for all intents and purposes an employee, if you will, of the, of the firm. And uh, I, I think the semantics of whether you have a 
contract relationship with somebody around the corner or you've got this offshore person, it's basically a, a key individual to the success of the company. So treating them as such is, is very helpful, which brings me to some of the positives that I believe are really needing to be noted here. Um, Clearly, you pointed out the financial benefit that you can easily afford somebody that is extremely competent and capable for much less than you can here locally. But coupling that with the idea that we're struggling here in the United States because of the staffing shortage that we have, there's so few accounting professionals to do the work that when I work with firms and I'm talking to the owner and they're saying that they're turning away work or they feel they could grow more much more quickly. And the reason for the the lack of growth and the expansion is because we can't find qualified staff needs to be asked, well, are you considering and have you looked at this as an option? And too often it's, no, I haven't considered it. And when they get introduced to the philosophy and the concept, it, it can really open up a lot of doors and if anything, the floodgates of now we can really accelerate the growth of our company because I think we can now with the processes we have in place, scale our business as we hoped we could. We just couldn't find the staff here locally. So I'm going to just real quickly attest to a few things and then I'd like to get your comments. Okay. So here's my experience without uh, offshoring. Um, we first of all dealt with it from a technology point of view probably 15 years ago. Uh, we tested it with some employees. We had them starting to work out of the main office uh, with the internet and so forth, uh, VoIPs, uh, voice over IP for yep. phone calling. Uh, what we were trying to do is just see, could the technology work? And I had an employee that moved to the East Coast and I had an employee that worked in Guam. And in both those ex extremes, we had somebody far to the East Coast, somebody that was over in the Pacific we found that technologically we could pull this off. The fact that they were remote was not relevant any longer. The second thing became cultural. And we realized what was needed for our success working with somebody out of the office was the more clear we could be with the expectations, the key metrics that they needed to perform and meet so that we didn't have to micromanage them, that we could just basically say, get this task done, and we would use this to gauge whether or not you're being productive or effective. That allowed us to manage them. So clear objectives, that was the second thing. So technology taking care of clear objectives. But then the third thing was this cultural thing, meeting with them regularly, uh, if, if not uh, more often, at least weekly, and having very clear tasks that they were able to perform that they could report back that they were done or not. That, that, weekly interaction, that collaboration, that helping open up the dialogue so that they felt comfortable to ask questions like you were alluding to earlier, that was very, very key. And it brings me to the point now where I believe I'm currently working with, I think it's six or seven offshore individuals. I have someone in Kenya. I've got a few individuals in the Philippines. Um, I work with a firm that's out of Costa Rica. Um, so I'm in a position where I'm very comfortable with this and here's where I'm going. It's this last thing. One, one part of working with a lot of people in the United States is we do find that there, there are concerns, especially with remote workers. More than, more than half of my employees work out of the office, okay? They're all around the country. Um, the fact that I struggle with their loyalty to the business, their commitment to stay on board, the concern that they may for another dollar an hour jump ship and go somewhere else, isn't that way with the offshore people that I work with? I've worked with these offshore people for years and found that they are very committed and they are excited, honored to actually work with a U.S. firm. And in my case, uh, they, they are intimidated working with me directly as the president. But as they work with my staff and so forth, they're privileged and honored to be able to say that they work for a U.S. business directly with the leadership of the organization. They have uh, positions that they're honestly paid fairly well, as I understand it, in their cultures. So they're not going anywhere and they're holding yeah. on. And I'm seeing these people thrive in, in the working relationships they have. And they're an integral part of our success. And I don't, I don't, I'm not worried about them leaving. They're, they're not going anywhere and uh, they're honored to be part of our team. So what is your experience with the culture and the level of commitment that these people have to the jobs that they're doing for us here in the United States? Yeah, exactly the same. I mean, it's what, previously was happening was a lot of a lot of firms would treat the outsourcing firms very similar to as though they were a product 
right at the end of the day and they were they were outsourcing tasks and work they were getting it back but maybe it was the same person working on those things and they were relying on the outsourcing firms to really have that cultural side of it sorted out and all the uh, those aspects however like you're saying i mean they strive to want to work with the us a us business a us firm like they want to do that and and by you as a company now extending your culture and doing a bit of a mesh towards it you have to understand like that you're not going to change their holidays at the end of the day like they have different religions they have different specific holidays throughout the so as long as you're culturally aware to that as well it then becomes no surprise right but they they're very hard working cultures, right? They really want to work. They're happy stretching their time, but also at the same time, like, do they want to work a graveyard night shift all the time, right? They're happy doing it initially to make sure that they get everything together and there's a relationship form, but then, but then be more flexible when they get, when they get that opportunity to, yeah, I've learned how to do it now. All right, that's fine. Do you want to move your shift back a bit? Right. And, and those types of aspects, the same way as you would treat somebody in the US and really focus on the individual, not just the culture as a whole as well. Right. Focus on those individuals. And like you were saying with the process side of things, you have to understand as a firm as well, like the thing that nobody likes to do is change at the end of the day. Nobody loves change, but we have to understand that now coming into this, we personally have to change a little bit as well, right? There are processes we have to change. There's a way that we interact with our teams may have to change, right? But by doing that and investing that time, you will get people that are dedicated to you, just like you're saying, right? We have the same thing. Like I've already got outsourced team members, right, in the Philippines, in India. And the reason is because now I can scale a lot quicker. I, I can't go out and hire somebody in the US at my sort of growth stage, right? I wanted to, but I know I need other activities done and I've got people I know and trust and they've been with us already. So it's it's definitely something where you've just got to treat them as an individual, just like we would here in that sense. And like, you will get a lot of integrity and a lot of people that are really wanting to stay with you long-term, not just on a short term and won't just jump ship for an extra dollar an hour or anything, right? But it, it comes in time, right? And And you've got to go through that interview phase of really finding the right people for you. Yep. Now, the next question I have is something that I, I'm curious how you're going to answer it. Um, a lot of the firms I work with, whether they're looking to outsource bookkeeping or tax type services, they struggle identifying of all the different outsourcing services that are out there, the ones in South Africa, the Philippines, India, you, the list goes on and on. There's just hundreds of them. How have you found a good way to vet them and try and determine or identify who is a good organization to work with? So I have a very detailed due diligence form, right? So that covers sort of like the the technical aspect of in, interviewing them and getting to know them, right? To know like what standards they follow, what security measures they have internally, what infrastructure they have. Um, but it's there are so many different outsourcing firms. And that was part of the reason why I took a step back and looked at this independent consulting side of things because there are just it's so cloudy as to <laughs> where to really go, even what country to go to, right, in a lot of cases. So, I mean, just to super simplify it to some extent, right, I mean, you've got India, you've got the Philippines, you've got South Africa, and you've got South America. It's one of probably the newest areas is South America that firms, are, firms specifically are exploring. Mm -hmm. um, that means that South America – Great thing, central time zone, right? It's called nearshoring. Again, there's offshoring, onshoring, nearshoring, outsourcing, like a lot of different words around it. But yeah, you, potentially you can bring them onshore at some point in time, but central time zone, bilingual, and uh, you can find accountants and auditors, right? You can't find tax very easily um, there. But you have to train because they haven't had experience working with accounting firms other than maybe the big four. They've had experience working with private companies right? You've got South Africa, great from the assurance audit side of things. Again, they've had experience, they're very good communication skills. They can lead audits and assurance work, right? And they've had a lot of experience like actually coming into the US, right? But typically they're on a contractor model, right? So a lot of seasonal type work you can get done there. Um, you've got India, can do a bit of everything. I would say one of the biggest challenges there is communication though, right? And 
again, it is very competitive there now. There's a lot of firms that have started up their own offices over there, a lot of outsourcing firms, very entrepreneurial type area. So it is a lot more competitive to keep your talent. Um, and then there's the Philippines. Again, very similar to India, but less on the tax side, more accounting, virtual admin is great, very similar pricing structure between the two. Um, you can also find assurance work, but newer to the tax work, right? So you've got service centers essentially in different areas. You've got what level of talent I can get. It comes different in different areas as well. Um, so it's it's not an easy question. I mean, my big thing is finding, understanding the firm first to understand more about their personality and culture internally, because then I can, and and if they're very good at managing, if they're not very good at managing, right, they may need a more hands-on approach and go to a bigger firm to help with that compared to some of the other firms are very good at managing, have very strict processes. So you may want more of a, a, a smaller or a mid-size operation where you have more control over that talent. They help you with infrastructure and help you with getting the people in recruitment, but then it's really like your office to build at the end of the day, which which it comes different for different firms. Yeah. Now, do you ever recommend actually at some point traveling to go see the offices or where these people are working? 100%. So <laughs> especially if you are growing a team now, right? I mean, I would, same thing as like, uh, one of the easiest comparisons is like, think about yourself even merging or acquiring another firm as well. Like without meeting them in person and understanding the culture in that firm, the likelihood is of that merger or acquisition being a success is probably minimal, right? Um, you generally get together and I understand it's like a big cost to some extent going over there, but you, that cost will pay off in the long run very, very quickly as well. If that means you can A, be part of that process of hiring the right people, building the relationship with your team where like you've been really, really harping on in terms of like, you will retain that team. If you, if you go over there and spend time with them, you'll get to know them better than you will over a video conference, right? Or over calls. So you'll instantly build way more credibility with them as well. So you'll have a lot more people wanting to work with your organization too. Um, so I highly advise like, especially even exploring it. I mean, at the end of the day, if you don't feel comfortable about infrastructure and all these other aspects, go out there and see it, right? And you'll be pleasantly surprised and shocked by how secure a lot of these offices are. They're extremely hospitable areas as well. Like they'll treat you to dinners, they'll go out. Yeah. You'll have a welcome ceremony typically when you go in the office. It's like, and again, you'll be treated like a king or a queen to some extent. Yeah. And it's, it feels almost like awkward sometimes for me going over there. And like, I'm like, guys, I'm one of you. I've been here so many times. Like <laughs> you don't need to do this bit for me. But I, again, it's very, again, it's, it's, it's appreciative, right? But they really enjoy um, having people over into those countries. So I love how you shared that. That is very true. And uh, when you go to a different culture, there's there's something to be said for how they kind of treat guests and uh, honor people. So uh, we may not see that necessarily in the Western societies much anymore, but they're clearly there. Um, here's the other thing I'd wanted, wanted to know is where do you see this as uh, taking the accounting profession in the near future? How, how do you feel things are going to evolve? Uh, what should we be paying attention to? So, I mean, the biggest thing for the majority of firms to take note of is that the industry and the direction it's going, there's going to be a need for talent in the near term and the long term, right? So it's better to start gradually dipping your toe in now to really understand and work around some of the problems that come up for when you do need it. And if you're, especially if you're wanting to grow your business, like you've really got to start that process so that you're not going to get caught in the trap where now I really need to do it. Otherwise I can't grow. Right. And I can't be profitable doing what I'm doing for this reason. Or I have to sit. And what you saw like a couple of years ago is like all these firms like culling clients when they would have happily accepted a raise in price and stuff like that. But it's that they physically had to call certain clients, right? Because they just didn't have the bandwidth, right? So, which is, you could create different divisions, there's different ways of really utilizing that, right? And you're also going to see it in the private industry where your clients need talent, right? So now it becomes a new opportunity for you to build revenue because you can say, 
guys, I've been out. So I know how to do it. Come to me. I can help you find new finance talent, or I can take on additional finance functions if you build up this. And the longer you wait, the more like the more competitive it's going to get for that talent as well, right? So relationships grow over time. Start now. Start building the relationships. Get some trust with the people that you're working with offshore as well, so that now you can scale and you've built a bit of a brand over there. If you wait till if you wait till three, four, five years down the road, I can tell you. I mean, I already know that there was only really five, six firms in India, like in terms of CPA firms with their brand in India mm -hmm. 10 years ago, right? Now there's 20, 25 that are easily there that are producing their own brand. It's their office. They've And they're doing it through different ways. They're doing it through acquisition of these outsourcing firms. They're doing it through acquisition of chartered accounting firms, partnerships. And so you're now going to find that this talent is harder to get as well and you're going to have to start building a brand. And building a brand takes time in those different co countries as well. So it's more just get going with it now because it, it is here to stay. It's it's going to become more of a necessity than necessarily a an option, realistically. I love it. Okay. So the next thing is regarding the, the uh, roles of these individuals that we might be outsourcing to, um, there's – there's the virtual assistant, let's say, you know, the administrative role where it's more uh, task oriented. Uh, you can definitely get into more of the bookkeeping, accounting, uh, CPA, tax person. And now you're taking care of the compliance work. You're preparing financials, filing returns. Um, what I wanted to ask is, do you see very often individuals being utilized in a client facing capacity where the client actually is in one way or another interacting with these types of individuals or are these typically within the firm's more internal operations, more uh, behind the scenes that the client doesn't really uh, interact with, but they're perhaps aware of, and uh, it's just an internal operation. What are your thoughts regarding the internal versus client facing aspects? So that's part of a roadmap that firms need to think about as well. And that's like the importance of putting that together because it should not be step one, right? It, it's not step one. It's This is a gradual phased approach. I see firms that have worked with the same individuals just like yourself, like for seven, eight years now, and they do more client interact. And these are small, some of these small firms, and they do more client interaction than their own internal managers do. Right, because the trust has been built, they've been there mm -hmm. for so long. And they, and again, that's that's an assessment of an individual as well in terms of, A, can they do it? Do they have clear communication? Mm -hmm. Right, you may find some of those people that are in the offshore side of it that, now this is more of a back office technical person, right? Okay, let them keep them in that function, right? But there are definitely like forward-facing individuals. You're going to see it more and more in firms. I know that I see plenty of, individuals in the offshore centers now on websites mm -hmm. being clearly shown like, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, this is my team member. They've got, obviously, everybody's got their own email typically, but sometimes it's only internal facing. But we've got, I see everything. I also see with some of the bigger firms, they're investing in partners, right? So they're actually bringing in a partner now that is an equity shareholder that's actually running their outsource operations, right? And there's a whole leadership structure there and everything like that. So you will find, and that eventually, if you've grown a big enough team, like you will find more and more partners that have ownership in the US entity as well. And in the partnership itself, because they're treating it just like their own office, whether they're growing down the street, now they're growing offshore, but it's treated exactly the same. Yeah. Very good. Uh, what are some of the best practices that we should be considering before we wrap this up as it relates to offshoring? So like touched on earlier, right, standard operating procedures, right? So by far, assess your own internal standard operating procedures. If you don't have it documented, got to document it, right? It's going to make your life so much easier. There are plenty of tools now that we can use as well, where you don't need to invest huge amounts of time in order to do so, right? You can record yourself doing stuff. AI can honestly like create a whole document saying exactly what you just did and break it down step by step, right? Don't use client information on those types of ones, right? You can do it with uh, templates, but it's it's good because now you can save a lot of time. You can do it as you're doing it and create these processes, okay? That's easily number one. And the second is somewhat, I would say, another best practice is getting away a little bit from that email side of things and 
communicate whether you're using MS Teams or another function for like instant messaging. Um, and also like these meetings that you were mentioning, like having those regular meetings will allow for you to build a relationship and a repo, get everybody on the same page a lot quicker, and also improve that buy-in from your firms as well, right? From the other team members internally. So by having those interactions, like everybody wins from it, right? It's, it's, Email is being back and forth. People lose it, lose track of things. And it's not the best way for internal firm coordination a lot of the time. So definitely those two will, if you implement those two alone, you will have a much better experience outsourcing. I love it. No, those two things are excellent advices and ones to end on. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to kind of wrap this up. And as I do so, I'm going to come back to you for a closing thought and just see what more it is you would like to just kind of leave as a parting thought for everyone. But as it relates to an offer, I've got something here that's amazing for our listeners that I'd like everyone to pay attention to. In the episode description, we've got some information here regarding a free outsourcing improvement or discovery session. I'm sure a lot of you may have questions as to how this may apply to you and how you can leverage this in your firm, what it is you can do to actually take advantage of the talent and skills that are out there so that you can service your clients better and in fact, grow your business. If that's what you'd like to know more about, Lawrence is offering basically a session with you where he can really do a deep dive analysis of your firm and see what are what are those opportunities, what are those next steps, come up with a one-year roadmap of what it is you can do. And with that, he's offering a discount on his services as he can help you identify which firms can actually be those that you can lean on for your outsourcing needs. So if you'd like to actually take advantage of this, go to the episode description, find that information there, and schedule a time to speak with Lawrence simply because of the fact that this is, I think, a key way that you can consider growing your firm and taking care of the clients that you have. In addition to that, we also have a good deal of information related to other services that are available as it relates to working on your business. For example, if you haven't yet already, you need to get a copy of the book Red to Black in 30 Days. This is a how-to guide for accounting professionals on what it is you can be doing to work with your clients to assist them with the most common challenge that is faced by our clients, which is cash flow management. Take advantage, get a copy of this book as it actually is a how-to guide for you as an accounting professional to take your clients from being in the red to being in the black. Also, there are some additional services there, one of which I'd recommend, which is the turnkey business plan for accounting professionals. If you're looking at working on your business and identifying what it is you can take your business to that next level, check out the the uh, turnkey business plan for accounting professionals. See what it is you can be doing to actually work on your business. There are so much more. Definitely go to the episode description for that. Now, as a summary of the conversation, I've been, like I said at the very beginning, looking forward to this conversation because I think this is a timely discussion. One of the things that I really appreciated is exact, exactly what Lawrence ended on, and it's the power of the practice or the processes that you have within your practice. Those are, I think, one of the key things to ensure your success when looking at off, uh, offshoring. When you can actually say, whether it's internal or external, that you've got a turnkey process that individuals can do to perform a particular task, you're ensuring that you'll actually get the deliverable, the outcome that you're expecting, and you'll ensure their success knowing that the quality of the work is there because you've outlined what is needed to be done in order to achieve whatever that outcome is. Those standard operating procedures are so essential. So I appreciated his comments earlier on about that. I liked his history as to saying that he's actually been over to India and lived there for some time and got exposed to the culture, met the people, knows what's going on. He clearly has an aptitude for what it is that it uh, takes to find and identify the right businesses to then offshore with. The other thing that I enjoyed about the conversation was the, the cultural aspect. It's basically seeing these individuals that we're working with as being part of our team, an integral part of the successes that we're having. I do feel that these are individuals, and rather than just use or seeing them as commodities that we give a task to, we don't interact with, and we just assume the work's going to be done, is, I think, a little too dismissive. Uh, one of the things that I valued in the conversation today is just the communication that's going on with them as it relates to, this is how you would talk to an employee, this is how you'd interact with a coworker. Well, let's take that same level of communication to these interactions that we have there. The other was the value of having a chief outsourcing officer, uh, having somebody within the firm that is dedicated to kind of manage and oversee this liaison uh, and be the liaison for the company. The whole idea of having someone that is kind of responsible for this side of the business, I think is a, a key thing to consider simply because it's it's not just a one-off, it's something that we're doing. No, it's a deliberate thing that's part of our business model that we're using to ensure 
ensure our success. Uh, the last thing I just also want to bring up is the fact that I do feel that, like Lawrence pointed out, this is a bigger part of our future than I think many are willing to admit. As we experience a shortage in the staffing as it relates to the growth of the economy, the economy is growing, the number of businesses needing services is expanding, but equally the accounting force is not growing. It is shrinking. The number of people leaving the accounting profession exceeds those that are entering it through the colleges and so forth. So we clearly can see on the horizon this shrinking uh, accounting pool of professionals with a rising demand or need for services. And so to, in order to meet that from an, ec an economic point of view, is we do need to look at what outsourcing services we can lean on. And if you can build your business model with that in mind, I think you're going to, in the near future and uh, far future, be able to really grow your business and build a sizable firm being what I refer to as the premier accounting firm. So love the conversation today. Lawrence, what would you like to end with? Yeah, no, appreciate it. I mean, again, very, very good conversation. I appreciate you having me on first off, but it's, um, yeah, I mean, the difference, and I think you'll find more people pop up shortly as well, but I am an independent consultant from that perspective. So I, I don't mind who you go with as a firm, right? I just want to make sure you are with a trusted provider at the end of the day. And there's a lot more things that we need to do as firms. We need to sit back and put some strategy and talk about it internally. So whether you're an individual firm owner, like, and it's just you, sit back, put a plan on paper, and I say paper, but I mean on the system, right? Let's only document things on online, really use a cloud-based system, but put a plan together. Well, Lawrence, I really appreciate your summary there of what's going on. One of the things that I'd add to this is the fact that if we chose to not look at this as some temp assignment that's going off, going on on the side where we bring in some temporary service to just take care of a task, but really a long-term relationship that we're building as part of our business model to ensure that we're actually leveraging quality talent to get the work done for our clients, then this is going to be a great addition to any business plan. So really appreciate all that. Now, as for the listeners, there are a few things that I'd like to end with. Obviously, if you haven't registered yet for GrowCon, this is an annual event for the owners of bookkeeping, accounting, and tax businesses. This is a conference that is a must attend. Why? Because we put on the stage the experts that you need to hear from. You get to come meet with your peers, interact with your peers, find out what's working around the country and elsewhere so that you can actually see what best practices are going on there. Collaborate with them. Find individuals that you can team up with as it relates to the services that you're providing. And then meet the staff at Universal Accounting. You can meet those individuals that are here committed to your success so you can be in business for yourself, but not by yourself with Universal Accounting. In addition, I want to invite you to go to the episode description. Why? Because we have a variety of resources there, many of which you can find at universalaccounting.com. In the navigation, you can find free resources, just a variety of tools, eBooks, webinars and such that are there to assist you as you're working on your company. In addition, we also have for the podcast a best of. It's kind of the playlist that you can use to binge listen to various topics that are applicable to your particular situation today. So I invite you to go to universalaccounting.com, find those podcast favorite sections, and there actually binge listen to marketing, selling, pricing uh, discussions, mental health discussions. You can hear from the experts as it relates to all these topics as we've collected them in little playlists for you to kind of binge listen into. The other thing I want to encourage you to take advantage of is if you haven't already, subscribe to this podcast. Each and every week we release a new uh, episode with one of the experts sharing their insights as it relates to building the premier accounting firm. So if you haven't already, subscribe, set your notifications. And clearly, if you've been listening for some time, we'd love your feedback as well. Leave us a comment. We love seeing those and we appreciate those little insights. Lastly, as it relates to this podcast, obviously, if you would like to apply these principles in your business or learn some other things, feel free to reach out to us here at Universal Accounting. You can do so by going to universalaccountingschool.com or giving us a phone call. You can reach us at 801-265-3777. And always remember this, if it's about accounting, it is universal. Take care and have a great day and be safe out there.